Good morning. Welcome to Brick Lane Community Church. We are so glad that you're here with us today to worship our Lord and King Jesus Christ on this Palm Sunday. We want to especially extend our welcome to any visitors who are here with us this morning. We hope you feel welcome and we are counting on our members and regular attenders to go out of their way to meet and greet you. Before we begin our worship service formally, let's bow our heads and pray, prepare our hearts to worship together. Lord, who among the gods is like you? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? Lord, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship you acceptably with reverence and awe. I will exalt you, my God, the King, I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonder, wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Come, Lord, we invite you to come and be our audience as we worship you. As we begin our worship service, we ask you to tune our hearts so we worship you in a way that would bring you the most glory. Amen. Come, thou fount of every blessing, tune our hearts to sing thy grace. If you are able, please stand and worship the fount of every blessing with us. Song, 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 song
Well, this is Palm Sunday, a week before Easter. Listen as Kelly reads the account of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem from John chapter 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Please stand and join us as we give all glory, laud, and honor to our Redeemer King. in the theme of Palm Sunday. Our next hymn will be number 237, Ride On, Ride On in Majesty. This may be an unfamiliar tune. Tricia will play it once and then we'll join in.
Listen to the words of God as written by Isaiah. Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. Only in the Lord it shall be said of me, our righteousness and strength. To him shall come and be ashamed all who were incensed against him. In the Lord, all the offspring of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. This is our time of confession. So as I pray, I encourage you to be thinking about your own sins and confessing them to the Lord. So let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we come into your presence as people who have already been forgiven, but who are also keenly aware of our constant need of moment by moment forgiveness. Lord, our sins are grievous to our own hearts and we are regretful for the things we have done that offend you, but we must see them clearly own them specifically and confess them to you. For you have said in your word that whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. And Lord, we desperately need your mercy, so we readily and earnestly and eagerly confess our sins to you. We confess that we have violated your holy law both outwardly in things that we have done and inwardly in the recesses of our own hearts. We confess that we have violated the law of Christ in failing to love one another as we should. We have failed to love within our families, within our church, within our relationships with other people, and perhaps even failed to love our enemies as we should. For this, Lord, we are guilty. We confess that we have grieved the Holy Spirit by our unbelief and our reluctance to trust you and honor you by faith in ways that we should. Father in heaven, forgive us, wash us and cleanse us and renew a right spirit within us. We also confess that we have had an unholy attitude at times, having hard thoughts towards other people, perhaps being resentful or bitter in our hearts. We confess that we have sinned with our words, often hurting and grieving other people. We confess, Lord, that we have done things in our behavior in private that nobody else in this room or in the world around us would know about, but you see clearly and you know perfectly well, and we are aware of them and confess them to you. Father, please blot out our transgressions and be merciful to us. We also confess, Lord, that we have failed to do the things that we ought to have done but neglected to do. We are guilty of sinning against you by such failure. Fail to be all that you would have us to be. Failure to do all that you would have us to do. Lord, holiness isn't just holding sin in, but it's living Christ out. And we have failed to be holy and righteous and fruitful 
And for this, we ask you to forgive us. Forgive us for being so reluctant and so spiritually passive and so sluggish in our obedience at times. Lord, forgive us for the idols that we delight in and serve. Our hearts are idol factories, and as soon as we topple one, we replace it with another. Lord, help us to identify them, to call them what they are, to name them, and to confess them, and smash them, and forsake them, that we might honor you with our hearts, our lips, and our lives. Father, help my brethren here to confess their particular sins to you in whatever detail may be necessary. And when they confess, Lord, would you please hear from heaven and would you grant them forgiveness? Lord, wash us, forgive us, restore us, remind us that we are yours and that our only hope is the righteousness of Jesus. For this we give you thanks, and we pray in his worthy name. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, may your full, total, and complete forgiveness rest in the blood of your mighty and living King and be assured of his love and forgiveness for you. Psalm 138. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul, you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth, and they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you, preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. We think about those words in contrast with the events of this last week, specifically thinking of what happened in Nashville. In my mind, I don't know about yours, but immediately went to Conestoga Christian, our neighbors, uh, Windsor Christian, very similar school. So as I was thinking about that, I thought this was a perfect song to sing next. And I hope that you'll join in uh, with loudness in response to the questions that Dawson's going to ask you in song. Do you feel the world is broken? Do you feel the shadows deepen? So in light of what he has done for us and what he has accomplished on the cross, that he is our true living king, let's all rise and sing to him. Is he worth it? the glory of the Lord to be the 
the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus our Messiah hold forever those He loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again?
Let's pray together. Father, we do glory in our Redeemer, who crushed the power of sin and death. And with the psalmist, we give thanks to the Lord who does not only good, but is good, and whose steadfast love endures forever. Father, we sing glad songs of salvation, rejoicing that you have opened the gates of righteousness for us that we may enter and give thanks. Your son who was rejected with disdain, yet is the cornerstone of all our hope and confidence. And he entered Jerusalem, praised as a king, it was brought as a Passover lamb whose blood would be poured out to cover our sins. Father, we praise you because when we call to you, you hear our prayers. You are our strength, our helper, our refuge, and our salvation. We thank you for hearing our prayers and providing needed finances through cheerful giving to meet our ministry needs. And Father, we also know that you hear the groaning calls of those crushed by war in Ukraine and by heartbreak in Tennessee. And we ask that you to hear the cries of our brothers and sisters whose praise at time may be no more than a whisper because of their trials. We join with Jim Thomas, Lynn Ottavino, Jeff Hampton, and others awaiting your answer to their call that you would be their helper. We lift up the families of Rita Edwards, Lester Stoltzfus, Jerry and Sarah Ann Brady, and Mike Schelp, who need your refuge and strength in a significant way today. Father, we join that Palm Sunday chorus who line the street from Bethany to Jerusalem, and we sing Hosanna. Save now, we beseech thee, O Lord. Save us, O Lord. And we rejoice that this is the day that the Lord has made, the Lord's day, the first day, the good news day, when we remember your resurrection and the sure and certain hope it brings. And Father, we conclude our prayer by saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord who willingly stepped down from his heavenly realm to this broken world, was wounded for our transgressions, was bruised for our iniquities, took the chastisement for our peace upon himself, and by his stripes healed us. Glorying in our Redeemer, we say, Amen. Good morning. Uh, when I was a pastor of a church and I preached to the same congregation almost every week, big news events always posed a challenge. Do I change my sermon that week to address the, the big news is at hand, or do I press on with the sermon that I had planned, and if I press on, how do I adapt my sermon to the news? In fact, the Sunday after 9-11, I was preaching my first sermon as a candidate at my first church. I was too inexperienced to adapt that much on the fly. And so in general, over the years, I've tended not to let the news of the week upend my preaching plan for two reasons. First, it is not possible in a matter of days to grasp everything there is about big news. And so what I might say might be outdated in a matter of days or weeks. But secondly, more importantly, because what every Christian needs in a time of crisis when there's big news does not come in one sermon. It comes from a lifetime 
of hearing God's word, engaging with it, studying it, being familiar with it, meditating on it. And all that to say is you ponder in your hearts and you interact with the news of this week of that school shooting. And like Mike, my thoughts went to Conestoga Christian School as well. You will need to draw on a lifetime of reflection on God's word to think well, to process, to encourage each other well in light of these things. And so the sermon today is not intended to address that directly, though of course God's always word always speaks to everything in some way. But this sermon is more focused on the coming week, on Holy Week, where we're coming into a time when we especially remember the death and resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, Good Friday, Easter Sunday. And out of this, out of the gospel, of course, we respond to everything that comes our way, no matter what the news of the week brings, in our personal lives, or in the life of our nation, or even the life of our world. So I just wanted to say that, and then ask you to turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 126. Hear God's word. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, will come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. This is God's word. Ellen Glasgow was an American novelist in the late 19th century. Her father was a Presbyterian elder, tough-minded, upright, with what she called the iron vein of Presbyterianism. She regarded him as self-righteous and unfeeling. In her autobiography, she said about him, he was entirely unselfish, and in his long life, he never committed a pleasure. Is that a compliment or a slap in the face? Well, it doesn't have to be that way for those of us who follow Christ, and it has not always been that way. Before, there was the Victorian ideal of the unemotional, pleasureless Christian with a stiff upper lip. There were Christians like the reformer Martin Luther, Martin Luther was a fiery, no-holds-barred kind of Christian. He said things like, if you must sin, sin boldly. Don't namby-pamby around in life. Live life boldly, fully. Live passionately for Christ, and if you can't do this, that, at least live boldly and passionately for yourself. Well, Luther had a colleague named Melanchthon. He was the author of the Augsburg Confession. That's the Lutheran equivalent of the Westminster Confession of Faith. And Melanchthon was a scholar. He was very austere and very reserved, like Ellen Glasgow's father. Like Luther, Melanchthon had been a monk. But unlike Luther, after he left the monastery, he continued to live like a monk. And one day, Luther was so fed up with Melanchthon's austerity that he roared at him, for heaven's sake, why don't you go out and sin a little? God deserves to forgive you for something. <laughs> you know, for Luther, it was just wrong to be an austere, unemotional, somber, and joyless Christian. Well, Psalm 126 is a Luther-type psalm. It's one of the songs of ascent, the songs of ascent were likely sung on the way to Jerusalem as you ascended to Jerusalem for the feast. 
Palm Sunday. People had come from their homes, were coming to Jerusalem to the feast. They probably sang the songs of ascent on their way. For New Testament pilgrims, for us today, the equivalent of that could be anticipating Good Friday and Easter Sunday, but really it's it's our entire Christian pilgrimage up to the New Jerusalem as we ascend to the New Jerusalem. These songs of ascent we can sing every step of the way. And that pilgrimage, even through the Psalms of Ascent and even in our own experience, it leads us through a fallen world. A world where we are always battling our sin, a world full of tragedy and evil, as we saw in the news this week. And the Psalms of Ascent reflect that. If you know the Psalms of Ascent, you might recall that Psalm 120 begins as we journey through a land of lies and strife and war. In Psalm 121, I I lift up my eyes to the hills and I see the mountains. I have to go over those mountains. Where does my help come from? We have to go over the mountains where there are wild beasts and bandits. And it's easy to think that we are most fit for this journey if we are like Melanchthon, we're like Ellen Glasgow's father. Hunker down, slog your way through to the new Jerusalem. Oh, when we get there, we can be exuberant and bold and joyful, but for now, there's no time for pleasure, no time for joy, just duty. Put one foot in front of the other and we'll make it there. But then in the middle of the Psalms of Ascent comes this Psalm 129, or 126. And Psalm 126 is a chiasm. Maybe you've heard something about chiasm. It's a way they used to write in the ancient world, and some people still do today. The point of a chiasm is that the point of the psalm is not at the beginning, it's not in the end, but the psalm comes together to meet in the middle, and that's the point. And what's smack in the middle of Psalm 126? We are glad. In the Bible, the chief mark of the Christian pilgrim is gladness and joy. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, and so on. In Philippians 4.4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Where was Paul when he wrote that? Paul was in a Roman prison. And that reminds us that... um, The joy, the gladness that the Bible talks so much about and commands us in Philippians is, it's not mere lightheartedness. You know, you can, um, sometimes we try to get joy through entertainment in return to subjecting ourselves to many minutes of advertising or for the price of a ticket, we watch something on a screen for an hour or two and it helps us forget the things that trouble us. For a moment, we buy someone else's imagination to divert us, to make our hearts a little bit lighter in the moment. And the effects of this are temporary. We know this, of course, going in. It might last a few minutes, a few hours if you're lucky. Priscilla and I watched a movie on Friday night, and Saturday morning, Priscilla asked me, do you still think about that movie last night, this morning? And I said, no, I've forgotten about it. You know, it doesn't last very long. So let's be sure we don't mistake this kind of of lightheartedness for the joy and gladness of our pilgrimage, of our ascent. Especially in light of Philippians, Paul wrote that from a prison. Think of it this way. Um, Do you have a favorite chair at home that you like to sit in when maybe you come home from work and... Ah, this is my chair. Well, joy and gladness have a favorite chair, too. And in the Bible, we see what the chair, the favorite chair of joy and gladness is, and it's a little bit surprising. The place where joy and gladness thrive the most is the chair of brokenness, weakness, grief, suffering, struggle with sin, and its fruits. That's where joy likes to sit the most. Like here in Psalm 126 and in the 
in the middle of the Psalms of Ascent, in the midst of the challenges of our pilgrimage, Psalm 126 says, we are glad. Well, think of Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is David's psalm of repentance after he had committed adultery and murder. And there in verse 8, he prays this, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. And God doesn't say, oh, the gall of this adulterer and murderer. How dare he ask for joy and gladness? He needs to wallow in it for a long time. No, joy thrives in the midst of our brokenness. And in Psalm 126, we're in the thick of life in a fallen world, in the desert. But we feed on God's acts of restoration in the past. And we look to God's deeds of restoration in the future. And with that, you have the outline of Psalm 126. In verses 1 to 3, we feed on God's past deeds of restoration. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion. When you think Zion, think the people of God of which I am now still a part. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Then our mouth was filled with laughter, our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. and We are glad. You know, if you read the Old Testament, there's many times when God restored his people in Seemingly intractable and impossible situations. God delivered Israel from slavery in Egypt. And then they came to the Red Sea, and, and there was the sea in front of them and Pharaoh's army behind them. It seemed hopeless. And God opened the sea, and they crossed, crossed through as on dry land. And, and Miriam took up a tambourine in verse 20, and all the women went after her with tambourines and dancing. Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. Well, think of the book of Judges. Again and again, God delivers people through Ehud, through Gideon, through Samson. Well, think of David, who experienced this again and again, deliverance from his enemies, from Saul and so many others. Even in Psalm 51, from the guilt of his own sin. And at the end of his life, David sang, 2 Samuel 22, 47, The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be my God, the rock of my salvation. I hope those will be my last words. I hope God gives me grace to say that at the end. Or think of the return from exile in Babylon. Isaiah prophesied what it would be like in Isaiah 52. How beautiful upon the mountain are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, again to the people of God, your God reigns. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice together. They sing for joy. For eye to eye, they see the return of the Lord to Zion. In all these instances, you see God's people were like those who dreamed. Their mouths were filled with laughter, their tongues with shouts of joy, and the nations marveled at what God had done. But of course, for the psalmist, the ultimate fulfillment of this was still in the future with Christ, and so we today on our pilgrimage, and in particular this week, as we anticipate Good Friday and Easter Sunday, we can rejoice in those past deliverances of God's people because we are one people with them, but we can also look back on even more the life, birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He conquered not only the horse and the rider of Egypt, he conquered sin and death itself once and for all. And he did not do it in a lighthearted fashion like in a TV sitcom or even a good movie. Remember how he did it? He came into all the songs of ascent and he walked through all of them 
as a human being just like us. He, tr he, he came into the world of lies and strife in Psalm 120. He walked over the mountains of Psalm 121. He endured the scorn and contempt of Psalm 123. He was a victim of wicked rulers of Psalm 125. He was, Isaiah 53, 3 says, despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. He entered into this world. And yet, Hebrews 12, 2 says this, unfathomably, that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. What joy was that? What could possibly make the cross a joy? Well, it was the joy of obedience to the Father. It was the joy of fulfilling the Father's design that by his suffering in his death, he would drink the wrath of God for all those who look to him in faith. He would atone for their sin on the cross. He would be raised again and pour out his spirit on them so that they would become like him. He would bring many sons and daughters to glory. For this joy, he endured the cross. Again, joy's favorite chair is weakness, brokenness, and suffering. And when we look back on what Jesus did, we have every cause to wonder. Open mouth, mouths filled with laughter like those who dream at how God has restored our fortunes. From dead in trespasses and sins to alive with Christ. Truly, too good to be true. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die for me? The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Amen? Amen. But joy is not all in the past. There is also in Psalm 126 a joy of anticipation of what is yet to come. He has been there for us in the past. He will be there for us in the future as well. He will finish the work that he has begun. Even though at the present time our situation looks very bleak. And I've often wondered during this week, I thought, I wonder what they're preaching at Covenant Presbyterian Church in Nashville this week. Hmm. Well, in this psalm, two images express the joy of anticipation in a, in a bleak and helpless situation. The first is a parched desert, the Negev, where you and it, it, it's parched and dry, and you anticipate streams of water that will come with the rainy season. And the second is the work of sowing in the cold, dreary, early spring in expectation of a harvest, like, like farmers are doing all around us now. Well, the Negev, first the Negev. The Negev was a vast desert in the south of Israel, and it was marked by ditches that for most of the year were dry and baked hot under the sun. And every year there was a long, hot summer season of waiting, and waiting some more, and waiting some more, and waiting desperately, and wondering, uh, are the rains going to come this year? And just when you think you can't wait any longer, that cloud appears and the water flows. And the rain comes and the barren ditches fill instantly with running water. Joy. Or oh, the, the hard planting that is done in late winter, early spring, when the earth is still brown and barren from winter, the earth looks hopeless. And the farmer may well ask, what am I doing this for? Can, can this brown, barren wasteland produce anything? Well, our lives can seem like dry and hard desert or barren like the ground in late winter. But again, joy flourishes most in those contexts, in brokenness and hardship. Sometimes it's like, you know, there's a very striking scene in Ezra chapter 3, 
The exiles have returned from Babylon. They have built, laid the foundation from the temp for the temple. You know, Jerusalem is still a bunch of rubble. And they carry with them the scars of Babylon. They've come and they've laid the foundation of the temple. They have it laid. And they have this big party. They're celebrating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's joy and festive singing. But then in Ezra 3.12, we read this, that many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first house, the first temple, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid. Though many shouted for, loud for joy so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. Oh, I love that. You know, the young people are, Laid the oh foundation temple, yay! And and the old people who remembered the original temple, they're like, oh. And so the joy of anticipating what God is going to do based on what God has already done, it comes in the context of pain and suffering and loneliness of life in a fallen world that we are still in. We do not escape yet. But in that comes joy. We might say, here we are in the desert. Oh God, bring rain on our drought-stricken lives. Now we're planting seeds, the seeds of the word of God, the seed of the gospel in the hearts of our neighbors, in our own hearts, in our children's hearts. We're sending it out to those around us in the midst of what looks like a barren wasteland, and we're doing this almost against hope because it doesn't look like anything is happening doesn't look like anything's going to come of it. And yet, even in that, in joy, we are confident that as God has done in the past, he will do again. And so verses 5 to 6 give us a promise. They say, those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Brothers and sisters, if you are sowing with weeping tears, know that you have a great future in Christ Jesus. First Peter wrote of this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power, you are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That's his promise. And if you're sowing with tears, know that that is coming. So we are pilgrims on our way to the new Jerusalem. We look back with joy on what God has done for his people in the past, especially in Jesus Christ. We look forward with joy to the anticipation of what God is going to do in the future. But how does that, how does that break into our present? In the barren fields of late winter, when things look pretty bleak where the circumstances of the present world conspire to rob us of joy. Where, where can we find that joy? Let me, let me close with three applications. The first is that this psalm teaches us how to read the Bible. You know, in our current time, we usually have a very short time horizon. We ask ourselves, well, God, what have you done for me this week? And so when we read the stories in the Bible about God's deliverance of the people of Israel and other things in the past, we say, oh, that's nice for those people back then. They didn't have smartphones and computers. They poor people. And we don't see the connection. But the psalmist in the Bible as a whole invites us to see those people back there to say, those are my people. I'm one with them. It is my people who were delivered from slavery in Egypt. It's my people whom God brought back from exile in Babylon. Their deliverance is part of my story. I share with them in the joy of God's mighty work to redeem them. It is my people 
whom God at Pentecost gave his spirit, poured out upon them, and they declared the gospel. And now he has poured out his spirit on me along with them. They are the great cloud of witnesses of Hebrews 11. They are my people. If you read the Bible that way, you won't struggle to say, oh, is the Bible really relevant to me? I'm reading in Leviticus. These are your people. You're one with them. The second application is this. Do a, do a little thought experiment with me. Think of a giant scale. On one side of the scale, put all of your stinking circumstances, everything that's wrong in your life, everything that's not working. And on the other side of the scale, put everything that God has said to you about what is yours in Christ Jesus, both now and in the future, and see which side wins. I think you'll find that side wins for sure. And then consider that all the stuff on the hardship side, that's just part of your training. That's just part of God preparing you, making you holy and blameless for the day of Jesus Christ, preparing you for God's kingdom. Here's the verdict that God's word gives. Romans 8, 18, I consider that the sufferings of this present time and if you know the life of Paul, you know that his sufferings were real. I think, this is hard to say, but I dare say none of us here has suffered like Paul suffered. I know that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be re revealed to us. Our grieving, our testing, our suffering in this life are working in us a much greater glory so that we, following Jesus, might, for the joy that is set before us, endure whatever cross our God has ordained for us to make us holy and blameless in his sight. That's his promise. And finally, if you've been trying very hard to write your own story. You know, in our day, we're encouraged to write our own story. Define your own reality. That's sort of what we're told here. And maybe you've been trying to do that. How's it going? Is the world bending to your story? You know, unless you have a lot of money and a lot of power, you can't make the world Bend to your story. You're in the wrong story. When I was in Bangladesh, I had a group of guys, and I said, has anyone here in, had been an imam? They're all former Muslims. And there was one man who had been an imam, that is a, a pastor of a Muslim church. And I asked him, I said, when you were an imam, if someone came to you and said, how can I be right with God, and how can I have assurance that Allah is favorable toward me? And the response I get was, no, no. The imam doesn't answer that question. He's not interested in that question. In fact, he would consider you a troublemaker. He'd probably, he'd probably get in trouble for asking that question. You know, they're in the wrong story. Maybe you're in the wrong story. Psalm 20, 126 gives us the story that you were made for and the story that is made for you. God really does restore our fortunes in this story, in the story of Christ. No gimmicks, no false promises, no hidden agenda. Just Almighty God restoring the fortunes of people like us who are lost. After we close this morning, there's going to be some people sitting up here. If you're in the wrong story, let me encourage you to go talk with them. Ask them how you can get into this right story where God restores the fortunes, where we can say the Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I, I do not know what struggles and challenges my brothers and sisters and, and others sitting here are going through. 
I'm pretty sure that some of them are very excruciating and very difficult. Maybe there's others sitting here who don't have any struggles or difficulty. Well, we may be sure their time will come. Father, I pray, though, that you will make us glad in the story of your mighty deeds in the past and the story of your great salvation that is to be fulfilled. And Father, allow each one of us to enter more fully into the story of what you are doing now. That we may all of us leave here today saying, the Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Give us that gladness and joy, we pray. In Christ's name. We save now God's good word, his benediction. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it.